We have a special treat, uh, a, a luncheon keynote speech with uh, Acting Assistant Secretary Joseph Yun. It's a real pleasure to introduce Joe. I, he really probably needs not much of an introduction uh, with this crowd, uh, but he is um, uh, our acting leader of uh, foreign affairs uh, when it comes to uh, Southeast Asia uh, and the Asia Pacific generally. He's the current acting assistant secretary in the Bureau of East Asian Affairs at the Department of State. Uh, his previous assignment was principal deputy assistant secretary in that bureau. And as you know, Joe is a career member of the Foreign Service, having served um, in South Korea, Thailand, France, Indonesia, and Hong Kong. And I would say um, of, uh, of the leaders uh, who really know um, the region and have put in the hard yards, uh, Joe would be uh, at the top of that list. Joe, we're honored to have you here, and uh, I'd like to ask everyone to welcome uh, Assistant Secretary Joe Young. Do, do, do we need this computer here? Yeah. Um, That's all right, yeah. yeah maybe <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ernie. Uh, it's great to be uh, back at CSIS. Uh, you know, I think uh, many of you know what a tremendous job Oni has done uh, bringing the Southeast Asian ASEAN program to CSIS. I mean, it is undisputably the leader of uh, Southeast Asian programs, not just in U.S., but worldwide. I understand this is the third South, South China Sea conference, and we're getting more and more people every day, you know, I mean, every time. And it's beautiful weather out there. I don't know, you guys must have something better to do, you know, but, but it's really a testimony to, to what he has created that, uh, that everyone is here today. Uh, as Ernie introduced, I am the acting assistant secretary. Uh, as you know, uh, our good friend uh, Danny Russell has been nominated to be a, uh, assistant secretary. So my days are somewhat numbered, you know, yeah. <laughs> I've been doing this now for about five months, uh, and so, you know, when I became acting assistant secretary, it's a long title, I called my mom and said, Mom, you know, I, I, I think I got a promotion, I'm not sure what it is, <laughs> you know. And, and he said, what are you now, you know? And I said, well, I'm acting assistant secretary. And she said, well, what the hell does that mean, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there it is. Uh, I do, you know, we don't have much time, and I do want to leave a lot of, uh, you know, uh, discussion, especially questions from you. So I will do away with my usual introduction on how much we've done in Asia, and let's move straight to South China Sea issues. Uh, and really, there are about seven points I want to make on South China Sea. Number one is the United States really does not have a position on competing territorial claims, and those are sovereignty issues. And that's a key fact you should know. And this is true throughout Southeast Asia, and in fact, it's true of a lot of the claims issues. We do not have a position on to which a claimant certain island or rocks or maritime features belong to that we have no position on claims, particular validity of claims. Uh, second, second point I want to make is that claims, however, must be based on international law. They have to be consistent with international law, including, of course, the Law of the Sea Convention on Clause. And Underlying that point is a very important point that claims to maritime space in the South China Sea must be derived from land features, that they have to be justified. If you are making a claim to a maritime domain, maritime space, then it must be justified based on land features. The third point I do want to make is that while the United States has no position on sovereignty, 
the United States still has enormous interest on how these disputes are addressed and how these disputes are settled. So that's the third point. And so you may ask, well, what is our interest in South China Sea? And I would count foremost in that freedom of navigation. This is an enormous global common in which a lot of commerce, by some account, something like 50% of shipping tonnage goes through, South China Sea goes through. And so we rightly have an interest that this commerce must be protected and that there ought to be freedom of navigation within this global commons. Second interest is, of course, lawful exploitation of resources there. That is, for example, we have companies that are working for oil and hydrocarbon exploitation there. If this is lawful, they ought to be continue to do their activity uh, 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 despite whether these are, these, these are, uh, there are claimants or not. So those are our interests that goes beyond, I would say, sovereignty issues, leaving aside who the sovereignty rightfully belongs to. The fourth point really derives from that. That is, we do not believe any claims ought to be forwarded through coercive measures, through threats, and certainly not through use of force. So that's the fourth point. The fifth point I, I, uh, I, I, I would mention is that then how should those claims be forwarded? And we believe this should be done through peaceful means. Example of peaceful means is diplomatic negotiation, Another peaceful mean is through third-party mediation. I would say another peaceful uh, uh, pursuing of those claims is through recognized international arbitration. Uh, so those are peaceful means of pursuing those claims. And if you pursue through peaceful means, then certainly there ought to be no threat, no intimidation, and certainly not retaliation. That is, for example, if a country decides to go through it lost, then another party who has competing claims should not intimidate that party that goes through arbitration. Then the other party should not retaliate because you have chosen to go through it loss arbitration. And for us, the way ahead, and this is my last point I'll make on South China Sea, is that we believe that given so many claimants of South China Sea, that it is very important that there be no immediately, no unilateral, unilateral attempt to change the status quo. And, and second point I would make on that is that what we need is really rules of the road, how the parties should engage. And this is why we support China-US attempt or beginning of negotiations uh, on code of conduct. This code of conduct is very important because that will set the framework on your behavior, on how you pursue claims, and what happens if there is a dispute. And so we're very, very much supportive of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, yeah. I understand that there was a recently a meeting between uh, China and the ASEAN states, I think it was in last week in Bangkok, where they had a working level meeting on the, the, the predecessor to COC was, of course, DOC, and on DOC. And I think there, there seems to be an understanding that at a future date, maybe sometime this year, they will announce a formal beginning of negotiations on COC. If that's the case, we will genuinely welcome it.
because we see COC as a key piece of puzzle that will bring peaceful resolution, peaceful negotiation, and peaceful pursuant to these claims. This is an issue that goes back a long ways. And I think it, you know, behind it a number of historical issues, behind it a number of traditional issues. And I would say over the last few years, things have become a little bit more tense. There have been a number of fishing boat incidents. There have been a number of incidents uh, involving exploration vessels from various partners. And last year, around this time, we had a, a, a Scarborough Shoal incident. And before that, number of incidents off the shore of Vietnam. And uh, earlier this, this year, incidents of uh, Borneo, Kalimantan area, uh, near Sabah coast. So this is worrisome for everyone. And I think it is very much up to China and ASEAN to get the issue of COC settled. And certainly, a number of uh, senior US officials, including President Obama in last year's East Asia Summit, and of course, Secretary Clinton has made uh, their views on, uh, known. And, and really, on this particular issue, while the negotiations of COC is between ASEAN and China, I would say anyone who uses that global common has an interest in it. And practically everyone I know of that uses global commons is very supportive of COC. So those are our views on South China Sea. And I'm sure with this many people, there are other views out there. I'll be very happy to entertain them with the help of our friend uh, Ernie. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Can you sit down or stay up? Thank you very much, Joe. I think uh, that was a terrific uh, and very, you know, direct outlining of the of the American of the U.S. position. Really helpful, uh, and it builds on our discussion this morning. I'd like to uh, to open up the floor to questions uh, after I, I, I pose the first one as the chair, and that is that um, the out, the the goal of our discussions over the next two days is to build recommendations uh, that you can use in preparing Secretary Kerry and the President um, for their um, trips. And I, I know Secretary Kerry is planning on a trip uh, to the region in June. Uh, for the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the President would plan to go to Brunei um, and some other places in October uh, for the East Asia Summit. Um, is there, what's the state of, of current planning and your current thinking on how the United States could be, use these two meetings to advance some of the points that, that you discussed uh, this morning? I think for us, uh, there are a uh, number of uh, important aspects to it. I think number one is for recognition to everyone to know that this is really, I would say, cockpit of global economy. That uh, any threat there will affect economic growth and development. And I think uh, 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 everyone is trying to understand that. Second thing is high-level engagement. Uh, I know that, of course, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Secretary Kerry will be going to ASEAN Regional Forum, and there will also be, in that same uh, uh, venue in Brunei, we'll also have East Asia Summit Foreign Ministers Meeting, as well as U.S.-ASEAN Foreign Ministers Meeting. I think for us, it is important to gain consensus among ASEANs. And of course, over the coming weekend, in fact, uh, Friday and Saturday, President Obama will be seeing uh, 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 President Xi Jinping in, in California. And so these are broad level discussions that I think as our leaders have to convey their points, I think they will begin to realize the importance of uh, economic stability and moreover, the importance of what the idea 
global commons that is at work here. So I think as we exchange these views, to come to an agreement, or come to an understanding, you know, to be frank with you, I'm not sure these territorial disputes, whether they're maritime or whatever, can ever be fully resolved in the sense one party says, damn, I think you're right, you know? Uh, I never thought about that, you know? Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen, but at least, you know, I have a working hypothesis or working idea, you know, operations on how we do not disturb uh, stability in the region. That's the goal, Ernie. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me open it up. Uh, the lady in the red. Uh... Hi, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Nadia Chow, Washington correspondent for Liberty Times. Uh, we know uh, the code of conduct is very important, but uh, Taiwan has never been included uh, during the process of a dialogue. Given the recent incident between the fish, the fishing boat incident between Philippines and Taiwan, do you think that you know it's important to find a way for Taiwan to participate in dialogue? Will U.S. encourage that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very aware, of course, the recent fishing boat incident in which uh, Taiwanese uh, fishing boat captain, I believe, lost his life. And it's a very, very regretful incident. And that is precisely why I believe we need uh, something like code of conduct. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I think code of conduct, it, when China and uh, ASEAN agree, is something that becomes operational throughout South China Sea. And certainly we're not involved, and, and parties other than China and ASEAN are not involved. But there is no reason why other countries cannot say, you know, uh, adhere to that code of conduct. So I'm not sure the importance of actually being on the negotiating table uh, as much as importance between the claimants who are the disputant coming to terms with that. Thank you. Okay, I have Chris uh, Nelson and then the gentleman here. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Um, those of us who were just out at the Shangri-La conference, and forgive me for repeating for those who were here, um, found it frustrating that uh, uh, in the face of every expli very explicit question to our Chinese friends about our concerns about the rise of uh, the use of, of uh, coercion, uh, either explicit or implicit, uh, the basic response was, uh, 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 these aren't claims, these are our islands, there's really nothing to discuss, uh, what are you talking about? Um, are you getting that kind of response when you, all, when you try to discuss these things with our Chinese friends, or is there more likelihood of a, of a, a, a discussion that recognizes the gravity uh, of, of the risks that are involved and, uh, and what do you anticipate uh, uh, the response may well be out in California uh, when the president uh, does, as, he, as they made clear from the NSC briefing last night, they will raise these issues. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm not sure with all the cameras around I should be commenting what the president might say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, this weekend in California. So I'll, I'll stay away from that, you know. Uh, but however, uh, to, in regards to your question, uh, we, we've discussed this uh, at, at many levels with our Chinese uh, friends. And of course, they recognize there is a problem here. And I think, you know, uh, this is, 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 is not a secret that, uh, you know, we have discussed with them on, on we pressed them on, on, on uh, how that the importance of getting code of conduct done. So at every level, and I do expect this issue to come up. I mean, maritime uh, disputes, of course, not unique to South China Sea. We have another one in East China Sea. We have one, for example, Tokto Takeshima between uh, Korea and Japan. I mean, United States has one, uh, has more than one with Canada, for example. Uh, so th this is not uh, in a unique situation. But I think what is a little bit different on this is that uh, this is a dispute that has such enormous impact 
on everyone in the region. And this is a dispute that affects livelihoods so much, uh, including fishing, hydrocarbon uh, exploitation, and uh, of course the shipping component. So this is where it is a little bit different and where the, the international community, I believe, has a stake in a peaceful resolution. I've got a question in from Twitter, actually. Um, this is from uh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, and the question is, the question is that um, uh, there's been a lot of praise for Brunei's diplomacy as ASEAN chair this year. Uh, will they be able to raise? Uh, uh, will they be able to handle uh, the pressure and r and raise these issues about maritime security at the ASEAN Regional Forum and the East Asia Summit? Um, and how do you see Myanmar's handling of these issues as, when it chairs ASEAN next year? Well, thank you very much from our fan in uh, KL, you know. Uh, <clears throat> you know, ASEAN is, uh, I would say, something of a unique organization, you know. Uh, and now I've been doing ASEAN work for four years. And uh, in the beginning, I was totally clueless. They'll probably say I'm clueless now, but, uh, but I think I've gotten to know it a little bit better over the last few years. And, uh, you know, there is a very important search for consensus in ASEAN. And, uh, and, and I think that's a, you know, that's a really an attractive quality about Southeast Asians that, uh, you know, uh, you, you want to form consensus and they will search long time. And, uh, I mean, to me, their capacity for patience is amazing, you know? Uh, and so I really do admire ASEANs about that. And so you will get criticism, you know, especially from non-ASEANs, that it is moving very slowly, whether it be code of conduct, whether it be c connectivity issues, creating single market issues. But I think that's the search for consensus. And given the history, they've had tough history in Southeast Asia, you know, for those of you old enough uh, to remember, you know. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so to me, even the code of conduct, they are deliberating. For example, on DOC, Declaration on Conduct of the Parties, that was signed in 2002. The implementing agreements were agreed in 2012, so it took 10 years from the signing to, uh, to get to implementing agreement. So I have no illusion, really, even if the code of conduct uh, 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 begin the discussion soon, it will take a while. And you know, by that time, Ernie, you and I could be retired. But still, you know, uh, I think it is the process of doing it is very important for ASEAN. And coming back to question, I think that is the role of the chair, to be an honest broker, uh, to make sure the press process and consensus is observed, and really have full admiration of Brunei friends for that. I mean, as you know, uh, Sultan of Brunei has been busy <coughs> traveling to go to all countries. Uh, and he came to Washington, I believe it was in February or March? Uh, it was two months. <coughs> yeah about two, three months ago, and he's really been, you know, getting frequent fly miles doing this. Uh, and, well, he's on plane, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so I think that's a great thing. Uh, even a relatively small country like Brunei is pursuing that. Myanmar, as you know, Myanmar will be chair next year. Right now, they are also what we call our dialogue coordinator. Now, how many of you do know what a dialogue coordinator is? Very few, yeah, you know? <coughs> what dialogue, co they actually play a very important role. What dialogue coordinator is that for non-ASEANs that have dialogue with ASEAN, like the US, like China, Japan, Korea, they have a coordinator who act as an intermediary. And so uh, it's the turn of Myanmar to be the U.S. dialogue coordinator, and, and they're doing a great job. I mean, let me tell you the importance of dialogue coordinator. Right now, Thailand is the dialogue coordinator between ASEAN and China. 
which is why the meetings were held in Bangkok uh, between ASEAN and China last week. And they are doing a great job trying to move this process along, you know, being the go-between between ASEAN and China on code of conduct especially. So, you know, uh, I, our hats are off to ASEAN. And for us, engaging ASEAN is a very important pillar of what we call rebalance to, uh, to, to Asia. And we've expended considerable effort in that. As you know, we now have two missions in Jakarta, one for Indonesia, one for ASEAN. We've joined all the uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, conferences and summits that go with ASEAN, including East Asia's summit, you know, uh, you know, defense minister's dialogue, and so on. So ASEAN of today is not the ASEAN of, say, 20 years ago. It's much more dynamic, and it is much more inclusive, and I would say much more strategic. Thank you, Joe. Uh, the gentleman here. <coughs> My name is Vishnu Poudel, National Advisory Council, South Asian Affairs. My observation over the years have been that when these head of states meet, very pleasant, all problems are solved. <coughs> and they depart with a very beautiful, agreeable communication. And I'm sp speaking especially in the context of President C and President Obama meeting in Los Angeles in a couple of days. And then I'm afraid after that meeting is over, beautiful communication is are issued, and the whole world is happy. Now everything is going to, great, going to be great. Then when they go back, after some time, the situation remains as is. And nothing much is changed, just as Secretary Joseph said, that co code of conduct was passed 12 years ago. It took 12 years. So th is there a, any strategic plan that we, the United States of America, are thinking through about those issues, be it with Putin, be it with Z, or be it with anybody? Thank you very much. I think you know what you should probably realize, I'm sure many people do, is summits are kind of uh, what the two leaders do. And, but there are a lot of work that go on before the summit. Uh, and you know, for example, you know, uh, before uh, President Xi comes to Washington, I mean, sorry, to California, you'll notice that Tom Donilon went to Beijing. And even before that, we had number of exchanges, number of exchanges on agenda and so on. But I would say, just sticking with uh, California item for a second, this is something quite different, you know? Uh, and to have you know, really day and a half of two leaders sitting down. And this is a little bit different from other summits where deliverables are already there. I think in this case, the, really the goal is for President Obama and President Xi to get to know each other and, uh, and, and, and to have a broad agenda. I mean, you can imagine, I'm sure you can guess, what the agenda will be. They'll range from security issues like North Korea, Syria, maritime security issues, to you know some economic issues, cyber security being example, trade and investment being example, to some of the tougher issues like uh, human rights issues and so on. So it's really if us, you know, the working level, is to do our work properly then we must have proper guidance from our leaders. So at once, it's for each president to give guidance. And, but more than that, to get to know each other, to get to know familiar. And so I would say this is a different setting than the usual summit. In a usual summit, 
you're going to meet for one hour, you know? And in one hour, you will go through the list and in the end come out and as you say, you know, uh, you know, we had great meeting and, you know, we accomplished X, Y, and Z. But I will tell you, I've been to some summits which were not as smooth. If the camera weren't here, I would tell you, I would tell you more, you know? <laughs> uh, 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 but 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 I think this this is this is fairly unique in that sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got four uh, four hands. I've recognized uh, Dr. De Castro. Without the mic, uh, I would like to express basically my appreciation for your very candid analysis. I'm trying not to be candid. Yeah, yeah very. Frank, that there is a increase in tension. And as we are discussing you know, uh, the, the issue right now, you have a situation where you have a standoff at a Yuning Shoal. You have a, a Yuning Shoal, well, you have uh, several Chinese vessels, including a frigate, confronting a group of Philippine Marines, of course, occupying a shoal. And the Philippines had received several warnings from the Chinese embassy in Manila that we better vacate that area or else. Now, the concern is basically this will be a template as China would force the Philippines out of the several islands it occupied in the South China Sea. This is clearly a violation of the principles you have laid down, unilateral action, coercive diplomacy, and of course the possible use of force. How is this viewed in Washington? Well, I think I would reiterate, I mean, uh, the point I made, which is that no party should take unilateral action that would threaten or be coercive and certainly not use of force. And so we do understand the trouble surrounding uh, this show. And uh, we are in communication with both parties. And so let's see what happens. But uh, again, I think as long as nobody takes the first unilateral action, I think that's what we want for now. Ultimately, resolution uh, to this has to wait for negotiations and settlement. But again, you know, it's often the case, I'm not talking about this particular case, that someone feels someone else has taken action first. So there is some element of misunderstanding if you look at uh, examine all these particular incidents, you know. Uh, so I think th they need clarification, certainly more discussion between the two capitals. Uh, and, and so we are well aware and we have been in touch with both parties. Okay. Um, Mike McDevitt. Thanks, Joe, for your clarity uh, with regard to uh, U.S. policy. Um, the question I have for you has to do with something the State Department used to do during the 80s and 90s, issued a series of legal bulletins uh, uh, on uh, excessive claims and what have you with regard to uh, violations of law of the sea. And I think, the l I've forgotten the name of them, but I think the last of them was issued in 1999. It seems to me the South China Sea is a, is a perfect uh, locale uh, for those sorts of legal interpretations of what's going on uh, to be reissued. Uh, so is there any, are there any plans uh, for the Department of State to start uh, issuing U.S. judgments on uh, excessive claims, excessive baselines, nine-dash lines, et cetera? I, I, I didn't know we did that in the 80s and 90s. Uh, yeah, go on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you? Uh, in the 1980s, and uh, there were very useful uh, law of the sea bulletins that were put out by the office of the uh, geographer, and then unfortunately the department uh, ran out of money, which is so often the case. So that's why that was lost. While I'm up, I might make one observation. Um, I had the privilege of serving as the agent of the United States in the Gulf of Maine maritime boundary delimitation case with Canada, which was the first, first case to draw a single maritime line for both the water column and the seabed. So in effect, it was the first exclusive economic zone case. And in the world of 
of uh, maritime boundaries and international law, one of the most significant problems, and I'd very much appreciate your comment on this, because while I understand that the United States does not want to take any position on the validity of the claims or on sovereignty, one of the biggest problems is always whether a nation will even recognize the right of another nation to assert a claim in the first place. And I would argue that in the South China Sea, the United States should be more proactive in encouraging the right of the literal states to at least assert a claim in an area which is so obviously in dispute. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciate, Mike, and uh, your comment on the usefulness of, uh, of uh, this uh, kind of notes that our legal department used to do. I'll certainly take that back and see whether this is also appropriate for the new century. Um, on your view on whether, whether in, especially in South China Sea, countries should have the right to assert their claims and uh, how U.S. will support that. That's, I mean, certainly a good point, but as far as I can tell, uh, I think uh, every country that has claims on South China Sea ha have asserted their claims, and, uh, and so I'm not sure we're missing anyone, you know, uh, in terms of claimants. Uh, um, but but it, it's, it's, a, it's a fair point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Peter, you had a two-finger on this. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Dutton, Naval War College. Uh, I'll just be brief. Um, the series is called Limits in the Seas. It's, it's still resident on the State uh, Department website, and it's extremely useful. One of the reasons that it was discontinued uh, in addition to money is that the two principal authors, uh, Ashley Roach and uh, Robert Smith, both retired, actually. Um, they are, however, both active in writing in retirement um, and have continued. I, I urge you to look in. I urge anyone interested to reach out to them because they're doing a wonderful job in continuing the research. This seems to be a fertile ground for recruiting the recruitment for those two, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I had Bonnie uh, Glazier next. Thanks so much, Joe, uh, for, uh, for your thoughtful remarks. I'd like to ask a question about uh, the issue of uh, y using international law and arbitration uh, uh, I very much support the uh, effort of uh, the Philippines, and I'm very pleased that the U.S. government has spoken out in, in support of this uh, case that's being taken uh, to UNCLOS. Uh, recently, Japan has also come out and endorsed this effort, and um, Vietnam has also uh, supported it. But no other states have. And I wonder if the United States is encouraging other countries, whether they be claimants or non-claimants, to back this process. Uh, because I think that if there are a lot of countries that are endorsing uh, the, this particular case, maybe we could get uh, China to rethink its approach, where, which, I mean, there's an ongoing debate in China about how the nine dash line should be uh, defined. And if we could tip the balance in favor of a decision to clarify that uh, their, their position, that would be really helpful. And uh, the fact that so few countries have really come out in support of it, to me, is worrisome and makes it less likely that China is going to feel pressured to do so. Once the decision is handed down by the court, if China doesn't recognize it, then there's a, a, that to me that has negative implications for how the dispute is being handled. So I'm curious as to what the U.S. position is on that and what we're doing. Thanks. Bonnie, that's a great point. And uh, I think besides Vietnam, there may have been a couple of other countries who have uh, come out and supported uh, Philippines uh, arbitration. I think the issue of ASEAN unity 
on this particular issue is is a key one, you know, and as is uh, in 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 many ASEAN things, and I think this gets us back to the kind of consensus that ASEAN is seeking, and uh, I mean to be frank with you, I'm not sure there is all that much wrong for outside parties to urge. ASEAN unity in this. I think they'll take their time uh, on this issue as in other issues. And uh, I mean, certainly it will be interesting to see in the upcoming ministerial meetings what the ASEAN views are. I mean, as you know, this, uh, it, this is an issue that I think ASEAN is having a lot of difficulty coming to consensus on uh, because there are claimants, there are non-claimants, and even within claimants, there is very differing view for the simple reason that, for example, you know, uh, Spratly's is disputed among many uh, ASEAN countries. So, I mean, you know, uh, to me, there is no ultimate solution in the sense someone says, oh, I give up, you know. Uh, so, uh, to, to me, the process matters and keeping the process alive, keeping the talks alive. I mean, you can say it's for talk for talk's sake, but, you know, that's not bad either, you know. Uh, and, and, and keeping dialogue going, and meanwhile making sure that most egregious coercion, threats, and certainly use of force is very much avoided. Uh, Dr. Thank you, Joe. Uh, you just made a, a six very important uh, uh, points uh, on U.S. Uh, South China's policy. I would like to introduce myself. My was was from China. Uh, my question is related to your fifth point. In this point, you mentioned that. The South China Sea should be resolved by peaceful means, I would say it's right, both from China and other claimed states' perspectives. And also U.S. supports to solve the South China Sea through the third party approach, for instance, it loss. So my question is that, what's your opinion if I say that the Philippine Arbitration Initiative was encouraged or instructed by the United States. If so, if so, is it still consistent with the US policy of taking no side? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, number one, I would fundamentally disagree that that we had any role in any party going to it loss arbitration. I think uh, you know that 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 is not the case, and uh, and 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 so so I I would I would say that is absolutely not the case. Okay, Christian. Uh, thank you. You mentioned um, the code of conduct several times uh, and its importance. How confident are you that the COC will be a robust and substantive document that will actually? restrain the actors from coercive or assertive actions in the South China Sea? And specifically, what would you like to see in there to make sure that actually happens? Uh, I think certainly, you know, there have been several drafts. And I think there is a strong feeling among ASEAN that for code of conduct to be meaningful, it has to have some teeth. It cannot be just DOC version two, you know? And so, you know, number one, that it has to be somehow legally binding. I think that's a key point. And second point is, you know, because this is about what to do when there are disputes, there has to be some kind of dispute resolution mechanism. And uh, I mean, certainly, you know, uh, I know some ASEANs are thinking that way. 
And as I mentioned, this is also about global commons. It's not, you know, just between the, the parties. And so I would hope at some point uh, they would be open to outside views that's, you know, beyond uh, China and ASEAN uh, to make it effective, you know, so that as we say, you know, everyone's goal is to have peaceful resolution of these use, uh, uh, this issue so it affords everyone, you know, something to really use as they uh, become engaged in economic activity, trade activity, fishing activity, and so on. The gentleman at the far right table, I can't see you because of the podium, I'm sorry. Could you please identify yourself? And yes, your my name is Lam, I'm a lawyer from Canada, and it's for my personal interest. Um, in the same family of a question with the lady in front of me, she suggests that uh, the, uh, the uh, on the country in the Southeast Asia, use it laws to solve the problem. But actually China, have a tool because China have used provision 298 of Anglo. And the provision 298 of Anglo allow China before the ratification to declare that China doesn't want to be submit to any arbitration. Therefore, we have a problem. I humbly suggest another way to solve the problem. Uh, you remember in 1973, there is nine countries who signed a final act of uh, international conference on Vietnam in Paris. And all these countries guarantee the integrity of Vietnam. And China is one of the signatories. Therefore, when China invited Parasen in 1974 and uh, Spratly in 1988, China in French violate these international treaty that they have signed. Therefore, using the provision seven of these final act, you can reconvoke the conference and try to solve the problem and invite all the uh, other country to join. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll certainly, good, good advice. Thank you very much, Mr. Lam. You first. Uh, I'm uh, Tui from uh, Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, thank you very much for a very clear position uh, about our U.S. Uh, interest and position in the South China Sea. But you know, from my observation uh, about situation in the South China Sea, we see a lot of points just to lay out are uh, disregarded by China. For example, no um, unilateral attempt, no uh, changing status quo, um, freedom of navigation, no um, um, about issue of lawful commercial oil and gas activity. One of these uh, issues has been regarded, uh, disregarded by China. You know a lot of issues, right? And my question is, uh, uh, my, uh, my, my observation is that the uh, US strategy and policy in the South China Sea maybe is not working well in this aspect. And uh, the South China Sea is not only relating to U.S. interest, as you mentioned, but also on U.S. credibility, because you lay out your position and other parties disregard it. And my question is whether uh, U.S. should think to add more elements in the current strategy and policy towards the South China Sea. Thank you. I think whether U.S. policies are working or not, I mean, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, certainly, uh, we've had a number of incidents there. and But let's not, you know, uh, make it so black and white as any policy issues are, you know, uh, whether it's to do with Middle East, whether it's to do development goals, global health, and so on. 
you know, our policy is, is commiserate with the situation. And so I would say that certainly awareness of South China Sea issues and participation of ASEAN in this important issue have greatly increased. And, you know, I mean, this also counts the success of South China Sea Conference uh, Ernie is having. And so I would say there is much more awareness. And I, w I would also go f one step further and saying this is not just a U.S. thing, it's an international community thing. And, I, you know, uh, as I go to big international meetings and so on, there is tremendous support on the concept that we have laid out, which is rule of law, ob you know, observance of rule of law, support for COC. So these incidents, as you know, will happen. Uh, they have happened. And so we need to, a way to deal with it. So I'm not quite sure what you're suggesting, but you know, at the moment also to go to draconian end, I don't think that's helpful either. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I have to say, you know, speaking with the ASEAN countries, I'm not sure that if the U.S. you know implemented its strategy, quote that that you mentioned there, um, fully, that the I'm not sure all of ASEAN would support that. You know, it's again, it's this Goldilocks. Uh, we're trying to. I think I I see Joe and and his team trying to thread the needle a bit here, and it does take uh, some compromise and and um, careful steps. Um, the gentleman from Taiwan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yuan, for your speech. I'm Ian Hui Song from Academia Seneca. Uh, my question is about related to code of conduct. From Taiwan's perspective, in my view, President Ma would like to see an early conclusion of the COC in the South China Sea with the invitation to, to Taiwan to participate. But now, if if the, uh, the negotiation process for adoption of the COC takes too long, do you think it is consistent with U.S. national interests in the South China Sea to have any parties to the dispute to propose peace initiative in the South China Sea, certainly including an outsider to the dispute, the United States, to propose a peace initiative in the South China Sea? Thank you. Uh, personally, I don't see anything wrong with any proposal for peace initiative. I mean, who doesn't like peace, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I, I, I think everyone ought to be free to pursue and propose peace initiative. This one doesn't, yeah. That could be the uh, that could be the House of uh, Representatives calling him. He's got to testify uh, in, in, in an hour or two, uh, Dr. Emerson. Don Emerson, <coughs> Don Emerson, Stanford. You know the the question that I think is lurking between the lines of this conversation, is, to use Ernie's phrase. Please call, don't call me Dr. Emerson. I, uh, thank you. Um, uh, is is this, is ASEAN the Goldilocks bed, the bed that is neither too long nor too short, okay? Now, there are several comments that suggest that although we can regret the impatience of outsiders and we can celebrate the ASEAN way, as many of us in the room have done, we can also ask whether the inclusion of outsiders that are marginally less patient and less committed to the ASEAN way and remember that that is one of the main issues at stake in the effort of the Philippines to move to a codified way that is UNCLOS, right? Then, you know, what comment would you make as to the threshold of impatience beyond which one might really begin to think more creatively with all due respect to ASEAN and its achievements to date as to how we could speed the process and how also the points that you mentioned in your remarks could be included in a COC because some of them, I mean, what has happened to the zero draft? What has happened to the non-paper, right? There is a kind of stunning, deafening silence with regard to this. And all we are told is that at some future point, perhaps before the end of this year, negotiations on a COC would begin. Whereas we know that in fact, informally, those conversations go back to a time preceding 2002 
when the DOC was born. So if you measure it by that status, this is really slow progress. And finally, when, uh, <coughs> when Marty Napalagawa was in town, and most recently today, at the Asia Pacific Roundtable in Kuala Lumpur, he reiterated his proposal for an Indo-Pacific frame of cooperation based on the TAC, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Now, when we think of expanding beyond ASEAN, you know, two possibilities arise. One is we improve progress by including folks that are a little bit impatient, including perhaps some in the Indian Ocean. I don't know. Including conceivably the United States or Taiwan. I don't know, right? The other possibility is that the more cooks are in the kitchen, the worse the broth is going to taste. Could you comment? Uh, thank you very much, Don. As always, uh, very sharp. Uh, you know, what Philippines has done, I believe, going to it loss, is that they have chosen not to pursue the same thing through the ASEAN. So it's keenly a decision, I believe, uh, that they made is that they are going to pursue this issue through means other than U.S. ASEAN route. And so, and they've also made it clear that pursuing through it loss should not hurt COC either, and pursuing through it loss should not, you know, uh, or uh, so. So these are two independent mechanism. So Philippines is probably among the most frustrated of the parties. And so it's really, I think, a uh, reflection of their pent-up frustration that they are going to it lost route. Now, I, I, I think their decision to have to pursue both ways is, 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 you know, we can respect that. But your question gets to, if they have done it both ways, should they, there be a linkage, or at least should ASEAN have something to say about the other path they have chosen? And uh, again, I mean, I you know, I, I think it is entirely independent. Uh, we certainly uh, have have uh, supported or have made a case that pursuing it lost is everyone's right. And it certainly would count as part of peaceful uh, resolution or peaceful manner in, in which that is pursued. And so I think as far as I know, again, ASEANs have not come to a consensus decision. Whether they will or not, I don't know, because they also see it as not, you know, it is not part of the ASEAN process. Gregory Ho from Radio Free Asia. Uh, since the China side is forging a new type of relationship with the U.S. in the coming summit, uh, I'm not sure what is the State Department's uh, talking point in response to this so-called new type of power relationship with the U.S. Uh, will the U.S. Uh, ignore it, uh, confront it, cooperate it, or what kind of uh, talking points uh, the State Department would advise the President uh, Obama in response to this so-called new theory. Thank you. Not getting into the conversation they will have uh, later in the week. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, this new type of uh, relationship or new type of great power relationship is something the Chinese leadership have said they've wanted for some time now. I think we've probably one of the earlier mention of this phrase was when then Vice President Xi Jinping was in Washington, what, about 18 months ago or so, and it has continued, of course. Uh, uh, I think, you know, we are all trying to put flesh on what that might mean. You know, between China and U.S., we have tremendous array of agenda. You know, we just deal, uh, discussed one today, maritime agenda. We have North Korea agenda. We have economic agenda, IP agenda, cyber security. What we do in global, outside the region, Syria, Iran, and so on. So, so when we talk about new type of relationship for us, it means more cooperative relationship. It means there ought to be understanding and cooperation that we work together, not just in the region, but outside. We work towards established norms, 
to respect international law. And so that is the broadest I can give you on what this means for us. And I'm sure the two leaders will have a great discussion on this. Okay, I'd like to thank you, Joe, uh, for taking the time. I know you've got to get up to the Hill for your testimony. But uh, please join me in thanking uh, Acting Assistant Secretary Joe Young. We have a 15-minute break, stretch your legs, and we're coming back with a panel on recent developments in the South China Sea.